Jason, thank you for joining me on for an episode of the Teach Music Online podcast. I'm so excited. Thanks for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited too. You have been a member of our Teach Music Online membership, which is how I've kind of gotten to know you and the many projects you work on and your experience teaching music online. And there's just a lot that you have going on for your music business. So I, I guess to start out with, what does your share with our audience, what does your music business look like? Because it's not just teaching, it's a number of things. Yeah. So it kind of has a few different arms. Um, so I have, I create music for media, scoring films and media projects. So that's part of it. Um, the other arm is digital music courses that I create and release. And then the other arm is I still do one-on-one -on -one private lessons as well, only online all online. So awesome. How long have yeah. you been teaching online? Since 2018. At first I was teaching, I was driving around and to people's homes and doing that. And yeah. that got old really fast, as you could imagine. So then I kind of started experimenting with teaching online. And then in 2019, I just made the switch completely. I was like, I'm not driving anywhere anymore. <laughs> You know, Seriously. I had enough students yeah. coming in, you know, did online. So yeah, I just made the switch. So the pandemic, you were all set up for the pandemic with your career, with your music production and courses then. Yeah. Weirdly, like everything that I do in my music business, it's all done from my studio. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of convenient. And, you know, I had everything pretty much set up. At least the basics were in place. Okay. So you, I, I, I think what I'd love to hear the most about is your courses because okay. you have created a number of courses. Let's like backtrack and talk about what inspired you to start creating music courses that would be sold online. Well, um, I'm a big fan of Leonard Bernstein and his um, young people's concerts. And also he did a bunch of lectures. Mm -hmm. For adults and so I'm not putting myself in that category by any means or any stretch but I just found them very inspiring and so I started thinking about his lectures and his courses that were you know broadcast back I think in the 50s and 60s um, and that kind of inspired me to try it and so my first class was super short it was like 10 or 15 minutes long I just kind of was like dipping my toes in the water to see yeah. if I'd even want to continue with it. And so I released it on Skillshare. I don't even remember how I heard about Skillshare, to be honest. I, I don't remember yeah. so long ago. That was kind of one of the first biggest ones for yeah. anybody being able to just jump on. And 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 for those listening, Skillshare is like a, a catalog of courses. So anyone can get on and learn a new skill. So it, it's a search database where people could come and search for music courses. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the first month I made like a couple dollars, it was like nothing mm -hmm. basically, but I realized I enjoyed it. So I made a couple more courses, released them on Skillshare. And then they actually reached out to me and were like, Hey, we have this program that where they basically mentor teachers. Whoa. So I joined that and it was awesome. I learned so much. I had like direct contact with uh, staff members at Skillshare who would like read over my course outlines and give me feedback. Wow. Yeah. So it was really interactive. Um, and then after, I think that went on for maybe a couple of years and then they shut the program down, unfortunately. So then I was kind of left on my <laughs> yeah, own. Yeah. You had these like, co you had, you had course creation coaches at your disposal. That's amazing. Yeah. So I was pretty bummed about that actually, yeah. because, um, I don't know, it was just fantastic to have the feedback from them ongoing. And there was, um, I don't remember how many other teachers were in that program, but there was definitely camaraderie and like really friendly mm -hmm. competition, you know, every month. Uh, so we'd kind of push each other and learn from each other. So were they encouraging you, were they encouraging you to build new courses like a few times a year or what was kind of, what was their goal with mentoring you? Well, they had, they ran these monthly kind of friendly competitions with the teachers that were in that program. 
So not that you had to join in every month, but if you wanted to, you could, you know, so I would kind of pop in to one of those competitions whenever I felt like I was ready to create a new class. Mm -hmm. And then, so I'd have, there was a, I forget what we used for communications internally, but we had kind of like a platform, you know, like a Slack or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had, like I said, I had the emails of at least two or three Skillshare staff members. So, you know, they would look at my intro videos to see, you know, wow. give me feedback on it and stuff like that. So it was pretty cool. I'm interested in your production equipment, even with your first courses, were you, were you investing in like cameras and lighting or were you using your computer to record courses? I had a digital camera, DSLR mm -hmm. camera. Um, but to be honest, I don't think I'm really, I'm just not good enough at filming. I'm not like, I don't have a background <laughs> in videography or anything like that. So I found using that camera actually a little challenging. It was a bit okay. too much uh, technology. Um, so I did several courses like that, but I found it a little hard to manage it. Yeah, so then I yeah. actually upgraded my iPhone. Um, I've done that a few times since I've been creating classes. So now I have a, a 13 Pro. Um, and uh, I just found it easier. It's just, yeah, it's just less absolutely. to deal with, you know, Um and well, so, you removed the barriers. You removed the barriers to getting out content, which I feel like a lot of people don't. They get stuck because they want it to be perfect and look great. And because of that, they don't ever record themselves. And so that's yeah. why I mentioned it, because you're telling teachers, oh, you can actually record courses and sell them online with your iPhone. Like, yes, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And like, the thing that I've learned, because um, I've done so many at this point, I feel like there's, well, one thing is I'm always trying to make some aspect of my course better in terms of the production every time I create a class. So even if it's small things, like I'll get a recently bought a new mic, um, and that really helped my audio for my courses. Um so, or, you know, a new tripod that can get uh, better angles for my demonstrations. Mm -hmm. So I'm always trying to make even the smallest of improvements with every new course. Um, and the gear for this, this kind of production is not very expensive. Yeah. I mean, the phone is probably the most expensive thing, you know. Um, right. And then, you know, obviously you need a way to edit. And so I'm still basic. I still do mine in iMovie. Just because awesome. I know how to use it. Yeah. And like the thought of trying to deal with the learning curve of editing software yeah. is just kind of overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. maybe yeah. at some point um, I'll make a switch over, but it's also like, I don't want to slow my process down mm -hmm. for creating classes at this point. You know, like I just, I released one last month and there's I, what I've learned creating so many courses over so many years is that there's a momentum that you can capitalize on. So I'm trying to do that now. So as soon as I launched my class within like, I don't know, five days, I started the outline for the one I'm shooting now. And uh, I finished that outline in like a few days. It's 36 video lessons, what? two and a half hours of class content. And, you know, and I was, that's like in a few days and I was doing other work, film scoring work right. and teaching work. Like, so it just seems to be getting easier and faster if you don't let too much time go in between, you know, each Absolutely. project, you know? So hopefully I can kind of capitalize on the momentum that you can build. Oh, that is such a good point. It's It goes the same with teachers trying to create content to advertise their studio or anything you're, you have to use yeah. your creative brain power for. It's like, the, the more time, the more space you put between you and that project, the harder it is to get going. It's in the moments yeah. when you're like, I'm, I'm excited. I have an idea. Then you stay up late and you script the idea. Like you don't mm -hmm. watch your Netflix and you don't yeah. go to the bar that night or you don't, whatever, whatever it is you're sacrificing to capitalize on that momentum. Like I, that is such a great point. We need to add that to the TMO course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Also going back to your previous question 
um, that kind of led to this. I've also come to acknowledge that while I try to make some aspect a little bit better in the production, I feel like there's always something with every single class that I wish could be different or better. And so I've kind of learned to accept that as just part of the process. There's always going to be something like a scuff on the wall behind me that I didn't notice when I was setting up my room or, you know, and you kind of just have to like accept the imperfections, you know, as long as it's high definition audio and video. And most importantly, is that the content, the actual curriculum and information is solid. Then, yeah. you know, you can always make tweaks and, you know, kind of grow and learn and get better at it, you know, hopefully over time. You've chosen to sell your courses through other platforms versus mm -hmm. hosting it yourself and creating a library of courses. Can you explain what that process looks like for anyone that wants to host in, in Skillshare mm -hmm. um, or Guitar Center or Udemy? When I joined Skillshare, you could just kind of join. But now I've heard that you have to be accepted. I don't know what that really? process looks like. But yeah, there's some kind of application process now. So if you're interested in that, you know, you'd have to go on their site and kind of, you know, there's a teachers or interested in teaching tab and just check it out. But yeah, so I started on Skillshare, you know, started to get a little bit of momentum there. You know, the benefit of that, of having your courses on one of those platforms is that you benefit from their marketing, you know, because they have millions of dollars in their companies, yeah. you know, behind them, investors and stuff. And so you benefit from that. Um, so then I branched off and started adding my courses to Udemy as well, just to mm -hmm. have another potential audience, different people. It's a different, completely different site. Um, the courses on Udemy tend to be longer. And so people are kind of looking for different content on that mm -hmm. site. And I also just thought it would be smart. Well, you know, if Skillshare ever crashes and or, you know, just dissolves, it'd be nice to have another platform already going, you know? Yeah. Which was good in a sense because they actually made a pretty steep pay cut to their, uh, in their royalty. To Skillshare or Udemy? Skillshare did. Yeah. At the oh, beginning of this year. <laughs> I know it was pretty, pretty They can intense. do that. <laughs> I know. I know it's a really not, not cool, not good, but you kind of have to know and accept that if you're going to play right. in their playground, then that's just part of it. Um, but then really cool was uh, at the end of last year, Ultimate Guitar, which is a huge guitar site. It's one of the biggest guitar sites. They have over 40 million users on their site. So they reached out to me and were like, hey, we love your courses. Would you be interested in having them on our platform? And I was like, yeah, let's oh do it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so um, that started out really slow. And then all of a sudden, after a few months of having a couple classes on there, it just exploded for Whoa. me. Yeah. And I was like, I think it's part of it is that people are, it's not a, a platform that has like visual arts and, uh, you know, well, wellness classes. It's spe very specific to music. Yes. You know, so I think there's some benefit to that because people are already going there, most likely looking for what you teach. You know, so that's been like yeah. so far the most lucrative platform for mm -hmm. me so far. So are you um, taking all of the courses from the beginning? Mm -hmm. Like you're from course one through number 17, I think. So I've been selective, I think, because what's happened is yeah. like I started teaching music theory courses, songwriting courses, mm -hmm. and then it sort of developed naturally into guitar courses. Uh, and that just kind of happened naturally. It just, my interest was going there. And then you kind of also have to, and I know your course creator module touches on this, that you have to create, if you want to make some money off of it, you have to create classes that people are interested in, mm -hmm. in and looking for. Yeah. And so I learned over time, like, yes, there's more competition, but there's, a lot of people searching for guitar classes and I was already teaching private guitar lessons. So it just kind of made sense like to start mm -hmm. to focus in that direction. And I'm glad I did because I don't know actually if ultimate guitar ever would have reached out to me if I hadn't. Right. 
Well, they so, are the lucky ones because you oh, had thanks. all this experience. Like you, you've been doing it. You're a t- like you are kind of this whole package because you have the theory background, you have the songwriting background, and all of that plays a role in even just teaching guitar. Like sure. the the method yeah. behind learning an instrument is yeah. way more well rounded, right? When you have all of that experience, and I'm sure they saw that. So I'm curious, did they? How did they find you? Did they find you on Udemy or your website or? They f- they said they found me on Skillshare. So they okay. must go looking for new sure. teachers periodically or they did at that time. Um, and do they just so have a handful of teachers with it's different pretty with limited. guitar I, or? They have some guitar teachers, I think some piano teachers, some voice uh-huh. teachers. I think there's some bass classes on there, maybe some production classes. Okay. But I think it's a pretty small pool of teachers. I think there's only about like 50 teachers or something like that. Wow. And then did they work with you on the pricing of those courses? They said like, this is, you know, the rate or did you choose your pricing? So with that, uh, you can choose your pricing on Udemy. And obviously if you're hosting, self-hosting which yeah. I probably will do. I'm going through your course, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. those modules to learn more about the different hosting platforms and stuff. Yeah. Um, but on Ultimate Guitar, it's um, it's a subscription-based platform. So it's mm-hmm. kind of like Netflix, right? So you pay a monthly or a yearly fee as a user, um, and then you get access to all the courses. So it's, it's okay. sort of like that. Um, and as a teacher, you don't have any say in that. And they like, like I was saying before, they run marketing. They have, you know, yeah. money to spend on that and to reach. And they already had like, you know, 40 million users. I think more than that, yeah. actually. And so they're marketing. And I know they're marketing to those users because I am one. Because that's, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just such a popular site. And I use it for my yeah. teaching, like in my private lessons. Wow as a resource so, as a tool. Okay, so they're they're your subscription gets you access to all of these this library of courses but also music and other things as well or is this just a subscription to the education piece? So the education the courses is a separate subscription okay. on their side. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I'm I'm asking questions because I never I haven't heard of, you know, the Ultimate Guitars subscription. So as a creator for them, and you said it's kind of exploded for you. What does that mean? Are they paying you based off of how many people are going through your course? And it's kind of like a royalty for yeah. number of users. Yeah, it's royalty based. It's um, it's not based on the number of users. It's based on how many hours people are watching okay. the courses, you know? So retention so. rate is important in your mind now. How do I keep these students yeah. progressing? And yeah. How do I keep them motivated to like come back and come to the next lesson? Yep. Oh, yes. That. And also how do I bring people in, in the first place? Yeah. That's been at the top of my mind creating the last two courses that I've worked on. Like an intro video topic, like the, 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 like how it appears on their site. Mm -hmm. The topic, especially when I started out, I was kind of partially just, doing making these classes kind of for myself in a way too like just I'm really fascinated by modulation so I'm going to create a course on modulation because I find it interesting and hopefully Mm -hmm. somebody will get something out of it um but then you know like that's so niche you know it's almost kind of too (laughs) niche in a way starting out like that so Right. You know, I've, like I said, it's been top of mind, like how to draw the most amount of people in. And then once they're into your fold and they like your teaching style and what you have to offer, then, you know, maybe you can create more niche, niche content. Uh Um, So it's weird. I kind of have done the opposite of what you're supposed to do. Like I started out really niche and then I've gone broader Uh and that's kind of where I'm at now. Wow. Well, congrats on, on, on the opportunities presented to you. Like I always want to say that good things come when we put in the time and effort to create them. And, and really when we have this vision of what could be, and I think you are a prime example of that and what a great perspective to think, wow, I really enjoy this topic. I, 
putting a course together, it, it, it's almost like a deep dive into a topic and you learn more as you're creating the outlines and doing your research uh -huh. and thinking of the best way to explain something. I mean, all of that is time well spent because it's making you a better teacher. And then Absolutely. the outcome is your students get the best version of their teacher because it's the researched version. It's not uh -huh. the like off the cuff in the moment during a one-on-one -on -one lesson. I always tell teachers like creating courses is you're doing your students a favor if you're offering them a course on guitar because it is perfected versus uh, in the moment. And obviously there are pros and cons to, to both. After a while of creating courses, I started to realize that the preparation for creating the courses actually was influencing my one-on-one -on -one lessons in a really positive way. I wow. think it made me a, a better private instructor, you know, because it forces you to think differently and to organize your materials differently, you know, and then kind of a nice little bonus is that creating the courses, I would, I create all my materials from scratch, like all the warm up exercises, all the songs and riffs I teach. Wow. And I do that partially because I don't want to mess around with publishing rights, you know, because you're, if you're going to actually teach someone's song and sell it, mm -hmm. I don't know about YouTube. I'm not, I haven't cracked that nut, but you're supposed to pay the publishers for the rights to be able to use their material mm -hmm. uh, or the artist's material. So I was just like, you know what? I'm not even going to deal with that. You know, if music publishers ever decide, hey, Skillshare is really, you know, breaking in the dough, we want a, our cut. I don't even want to deal with that. So I create everything yeah. from scratch. The benefit is though, when you then go to teach your private students, you have some fresh new, you know, worksheets and songs and warmups that uh, are things you can share with your private students. And also uh, for new students who were beginners, private students, because uh, one of my recent courses was a beginner's guitar class, I at the first several lessons, I was kind of taking them through a personalized version of my course using the same materials for the one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. student that I used on the course, you know? So it yeah. works both ways. I think, you know, being a, if you're a private instructor, it'll make you a better course creator and vice versa. Do any of these platforms have some sort of exclusion policy where you can't share your courses anywhere else or... Like is I'm assuming maybe for Ultimate Guitar they might have that. They don't, which they is awesome. They don't. Oh, they that's don't. good. I know it's amazing. The only one that I know wow. that does that is in Udemy. They have you can host your courses, you can choose your pricing. It's very flexible that way, and they do a a really good job of marketing too, especially mm -hmm. around the holidays. Um, and you know. Um, okay. Black Friday and stuff like that, cyber cyber mm -hmm. deals. Um, they, there's always a big push. There's always an uptick in students around that time from their marketing. Um, but okay. they do part, they have another um, tier that is designed for businesses that want to provide their employees with courses. And in order yeah. to join that part of their business, it has to be exclusive content. And so I'm not opted into that because I don't so, want to do yeah. that. You know, um, no, you don't. I, yeah. You don't want to sign it away. It's like when I first started creating some courses, I would have people reach out to me to buy my course so that they could sell it, you know, mm. on their platform to their users and just, they would just mm. pay like a large lump sum for the course. And it was always just this immediate, like as an entrepreneur, like no way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even yeah. if it takes me a few years to create that amount, it's something you can build and have passive income from for a really mm -hmm. long time. Yeah. yeah. Have you have you looked into OutSchool? I we have a couple of teachers who have courses on OutSchool. No, I'm gonna have to check it out. I'm gonna write it down. So Michelle Miller in our membership, she does piano courses on OutSchool. Um, okay. She actually created a profile to teach online group classes on mm -hmm. OutSchool. And then the demand for her OutSchool classes, live classes were so high that she was like, I should just record my lessons. And she packages them into semesters. So she so far mm -hmm. has five semesters 
on out school and they've done really, really well for her wow. um, because she's kind of built her profile up and has reviews mm. and all of those things, which mm. help when you're trying to build up in those communities. Yeah. All right, cool. That sounds awesome. I'm going to look it up for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Given that you have these courses you can put on these platforms. <laughs> yeah. So are you kind of considering shifting into hosting it in something like Teachable or Podia or Mighty Networks? Definitely. Yeah. I think, um, like I said, it's because I do a few different things in my business. For example, like my social media is really focused on my composing. So I'm, I'm really involved with the filmmaking community yeah. uh, and film scoring. And so I, I think if you have like an email list and decent social media, you know, you can kind of give your host your own courses and give them the lift and the reach, at least to start out with, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But if you don't really have that, um, it's a little more challenging, you know, because you kind of start from zero. Um, mm -hmm. And so having different arms to your business is for me is keeps it fresh and exciting and interesting. But then it's like, well, do I want to have, you know, three different YouTube channels and, you know, three different Instagrams to manage? It's a lot, you know, it so is a lot for now. Um, it's working, especially on Ultimate Guitar. It's working for me to have them hosted somewhere else. Um, but. That being said, I am starting, I'm going through your uh, digital music course, um, course creator program, and I'm starting to research and consider, because yeah. I think it would be smart, you know, because really any of these outside platforms can just decide to fold at any moment. And there goes that stream of income, you know, so Absolutely. it's smart to have it hosted on your own, I think as well. Yes. And there really are so many avenues for advertising. I think the biggest thing is choosing one to put your focus in. The one that has done the best for music teachers is YouTube, putting out yeah. YouTube videos that link to learn how to play guitar with my courses. Um, mm. Lauren Bateman, I hope that's her name. I'm pretty sure Lauren Bateman's guitar courses. She has so many YouTube subscribers for her guitar videos and I mean, a very, a thriving career selling guitar courses online and it all starts with YouTube sending people mm. over. So kind of focusing on one is helpful. Um, yeah. and, and really for your safety, building an email subscriber list that you own, that mm -hmm. is, that belongs to you, that isn't shared with another platform is yeah, definitely a, a good road for the long run, you know, and, and it's so smart to have those different branches. So you're not reliant on it. You're not putting, you know, everything in on this and dependent on it, but it's kind of like, no, in the back end, I can be adding my courses to a site. The pricing is pretty low for hosting courses. It's really not that big. So you don't have to feel this pressure to like create income from it right away. Mm, that's a good point. And the other thing I'm just realizing too, is with selling courses on the back end is something really great that your students can be advertising for you, you know, because mm -hmm. there's a cap that you have for your studio. And when you can't take any more students, you have these courses they can go purchase and go through. Um, and when they're, when you are referring people to it, you, you would want to be taking the full cut, not mm -hmm. sending them to another platform, but going, no, like this is, I marketed this, <laughs> this is my, my referral and having a place where they can make that purchase is, mm. would, would be a good next step. I think. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. I think which is probably why you things. joined TMO. <laughs> well, actually I joined TMO, um, to learn just how to improve my one-on-one -on -one private lesson. Oh, business. good. And yeah. how is that? How is the community and the course been for your online teaching? It's been great. I mean, I've had a lot of improvements, technical improvements, you know, getting my overhead camera set up for my, I teach piano too. Um, mm -hmm. So especially for them having that set up and there's been, there's been a lot of small changes that I've made since joining TMO, but it's deceptive because the small changes can add up, you know, so like overhead camera setup that just improves what you offer 
Mm-hmm. It just makes your lessons better. So once you have that set up, every lesson after that is just that much better and that much better of an experience for your students. Um, other things like just being more efficient in terms of scanning in your teaching materials, mm-hmm. the time that that saves. Um, there's just so many great little tips like that and big stuff too, like big changes, like um, thinking about your studio philosophy, you know, towards the beginning of the yeah. course. And there was actually um, one of your podcast episodes, you had this exercise, and I think it's in the course as well, where you're, you're looking at uh, what your private lesson business is and your number of students and where you would like to take it, Mm. you know, to stretch your income. Mm -hmm. And I think you had like a table, like an Excel table where you can plug numbers in and kind of figure that. And I actually did that exercise. Nice. Yeah. And, uh, (laughs) but uh, doing that, I realized, well, there's just not enough of me to go around to kind of hit the numbers that I want to hit. And I really don't want to have a staff. I don't want to, I just don't have interest in doing that. I have too many other things like the scoring and uh, it just be too overwhelming for me. Um, yeah. So having these, co- it actually helped me to realize like, I really need to put energy and build these courses out, make more of them, make them better and deeper. Um, mm. And then like serendip- serendipitously, you c- started launching this course creator module. Mm-hmm. So that, that was like so cool because um, <laughs> I'm kind of doing like, mostly focusing on doing your course creation modules right now mm-hmm. uh, and getting as much as I can from from that. Um, so it's been an interesting journey. Like I still am teaching one-on-one lessons and all online, but, and they're great. I have great students, um, but I'm, I'm kind of, not that I'm pausing, but I'm not putting as much attention right now on building mm-hmm. that up bigger. And that's because of the exercise. I mean, <laughs> That exercise that right. you you offer the students in the course and the membership, you know, and that's just one example of just how the information in your course can have like a huge impact on your business, on your teaching business. Um, and, you know, you can you can go to YouTube and you can find information. You can go to Google and find stuff on how to make improvements or but, you know, that's kind of like the long road to doing it, you know, yeah. and you're not going to find an organized structured course and unless you have um a mentor that's going to mm-hmm. like take you by the hand and show you like this is how you set up your business from scratch you know you're going to be kind of just guessing in a lot of trial yeah. and error the benefit to your courses is everything's organized you can start with zero students if that's your situation and build up from there and every you cover everything you know the technological pieces the organization pieces I know there's a lot of marketing well I am just thrilled (laughs) thanks so (laughs) much for sharing because you know I haven't visited with you in person or had a conversation and so for me to hear how helpful it's been and for every teacher it's different because we all have different mm-hmm. gaps and we all have different skill sets and we don't none of us have them all even myself like we none of us can do all the things the right way and so it makes so much sense to have a business roadmap um to have more success in your career especially when it's your career it's not just like this hobby it's mm-hmm. it matters it really matters your mindset and your vision and having people to look at who also have had success. Um, not talking about myself, but other members who have been before you and who have made those changes. It's like everything when you want to raise your rates and you see someone else post that they just did and it was successful and it gives you this new confidence to do those, to make those changes. Absolutely. That's one of another big thing that I've gained from being in your membership is just having the confidence to realize like, this is my business and I can set it up how I want and set the parameters. And I have control over that. That's the benefit of running your own business. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I don't know, unless you, like I said, you have a mentor or you were just, you know, maybe your parents are business owners and they taught you 
right? how to do all that stuff. You know, it starts, like you said, with a mindset and just realizing like you can control this thing, this business and, and make it's it exciting. <laughs> it is very exciting. But, you know, like I said, if you don't, if you don't even have that awareness, you're not even going to be thinking that way. Yeah. So you, I think everyone really needs wherever you can get it. You need that mentorship. And mm -hmm. like you said, this, your membership has this amazing group of teachers who are so accomplished and so many are so successful and supportive too. I, yeah. everyone we talk with, that's one of the first things they say is having people to look to. So you're not isolated, but also I love that our members want to give back um, because you feel not indebted, but almost when you get so much help from someone or a quick answer to a question with tech or trouble, a, a parent and figuring out how to reply or all the things. And then you see someone else who has a question about something that you have expertise in. It's like exciting to serve other teachers in that way. And I think that's why it's lasted four years now. It's been four years since I started. And it's like, we have teachers who are original members who haven't left because wow. they're now, they're still growing, but they're now, they now feel like, oh, I want to be here for teachers who are in the same journey. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, like, even though I create, when I realized you were offering the digital course creation modules at that point, I had already created like 15 courses, but I was like, if this module is anything like the one-on-one -on -one online teaching modules in terms of the quality of the information, I'm going to learn from it, mm -hmm. you know? So it's just kind of keeping that beginner's mentality that there's always more you can learn. My last question is for teachers wanting to, th that are teaching one-on-one -on -one and maybe feeling a little burnt out and they've heard me talk about course creation. Um, what is something they can do to get started? Like, what would you say is the first step to going down that road of creating their first course? That's a, that's a hard question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you probably want to start at least in your research, start with something that you're already doing, something you're already teaching, whether it's an instrument or a composition or something, because you're already familiar with it. You probably already have experience teaching it. You probably have some materials around it. So you yeah. wouldn't be starting from scratch and then maybe figure out what those instruments or those concepts or ideas would be, and then start doing your research to see... Mm -hmm if there's demand and supply for that course topic, yes, you know, but at the, on the other hand, you know, if you don't really care about or the return on investment right away, mm -hmm. kind of like what I did in the beginning was I just created this really short class. It was like 12 minutes long, like a mini course just to like, yeah, get used to filming, get used to writing an outline uh, figure out like the tech and the lighting and the angles. And my first class is still on Skillshare. I just, I've left it up there because <laughs> I know the information's good, but I'm sure like it would probably be super cringy. It's like a, I don't know, a form of self-love, you know, it, it was where Absolutely. I was at all those years ago. And, um, but, uh, you know, just not being afraid to make, you know, mistakes and learn mm -hmm. and, um, don't worry about it being perfect, you know, and it might take a few classes to figure out your topic that you want to focus on, but absolutely just kind of making the leap, just, just do it, just start, create an outline, do some research on the topic and don't, mm -hmm. cause you're going to make mistakes in the beginning, especially. And like we said, like your first couple of classes, you know, probably won't look and sound awesome. Yes. Like remembering that the knowledge and skill you have is good enough. Like it's enough. And it's something somebody else wants. Some people say, well, there's so many piano teachers though. Like, and there's so many courses on learning piano and that's true, but you haven't built yours yet. And it's not your personality with your expertise. And that can be enough motivation to go. Someone needs to learn it from me and my mm -hmm. method for teaching. And there is always room for that. And 
there are so many piano courses and guitar courses because there's a need for them. It's not a sign. It's not a bad sign. It's actually a really good sign because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people in the world that want to learn those skills. Definitely. And everything you, who you are as a person, as a teacher, all your experiences, if you perform, if you compose, all that stuff plays into how you teach mm -hmm. and your experiences. So, and there's no two people who are exactly the same. So yep. even there might be a thousand, couple, few thousand courses on your topic, but it's not going to be your, your course, you know, created by mm -hmm. you with all your experience. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So Jason's next course is how to create courses as fast as you do. <laughs> <laughs> we need your expertise. It was so, <laughs> just so great to have you on and hear all the things you have going on, but also you have such a good outlook and perspective on working on what matters most and just being able to diversify and create a business that supports you, but also that you're doing things that you really enjoy, not just things you think are going to make you the most income, but things you really enjoy. And we didn't even have time to get into your film scoring, but that's a whole other branch and what a cool gift and and career path as well. Um, really quick, tell us about the the dramatic film that you are scoring for right now. I can't talk. I signed an NDA, so mm -hmm. I can't talk too so much about the story. You can't tell us what it story. is. Or... Yeah. Okay. But I can tell you that um, several films ago, I started experimenting with scoring before seeing any footage. And so just reading a script and having a discussion wow. with the director. So... This film I'm currently scoring is like that. It hasn't even, they're still in pre-production, but they yeah. had a script. And actually um, the director of the film is one of my private students' parents. My, one of my students' mom found out that I do mm -hmm. film scoring and they asked me if I'd be interested in her film. And so, you know, we chatted um, and then we agreed to, to, work on this project together. And so I have a few couple different versions of the script. So I've just been read mm -hmm. through the script several times, had some conversations with the director and the kind of new ballpark of what she want, wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so I just started scoring. So it's been really fun. Um, it's a really interesting way to work without footage. You know, I've filmed, I've wow. done a lot of film scores with footage too, or your hybrid. Uh, but this one at the moment, there's no footage to speak of. So it's all just writing based off of a script. I like, um, can't even imagine how, how you would do that. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, part of I, it is like, I kind of know the, it is, it takes more imagination. I think it's the emotion you, you have to imagine the emotion because normally that's something you might see in someone's expression or. Yeah. Yeah. So like what I'll do sometimes is. I have an idea of what I want to write for a particular scene and I'll write it and then I'll play it, play it back in my mm -hmm. digital audio workstation while I'm reading the script for that scene. And I'll just see if it works, like if the the energy gels, like the the emotion gels mm -hmm. with what's in the script. You know, so Is anyway, something you send back and forth. Do you send back and forth to the director or to get feedback and change things or is it not at that level yet? It can be hard sometimes for people to visualize your ideas yeah. and could, you can understand in your head, like what it'll sound like when it's fully produced and polished, but that can be really hard for someone else to see that vision that you have in your head. So I actually, once I have the idea of how I want to score a scene, I'll create the cue, like finished done, like ready to broadcast in the movie theater to that point. And then I'll send it to the director so mm -hmm. that they don't have to use their imagination in terms of the production quality. Right. They just hear mm -hmm. it for what it is. They can listen to it. And then I'm always happy to make changes, you know, especially working like this. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's likely that once I receive footage, you know, some things might work, some things might not, some things might need to change, you know, so kind of when we get further down the road, we can talk about that. But what's cool with working like this, one thing is that I worked on a horror film a couple of years ago where I finished the whole score before they filmed it. And they took my cues on set while they were filming and they mm. were playing it for the actors to kind of get into the mood of the film. 
So there's just like, it's a really collaborative way of working. Yeah, very cool. Well, I want to listen to it and I want to see this movie when it's done. <laughs> this well, thanks. I'll share it with the group yeah. um, when it's finally Good. out there. Awesome. Well, Jason, thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. So we have so much to learn from you. I just appreciate you sharing openly your process and your career as you've built this this library of courses. I know there are a lot of teachers that will be inspired by your story. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It was really fun. I feel like we could keep going for like another we hour. We could, we could. <laughs> we'll have to do a part two in a year. <laughs> sure, yeah.